Hello everyone. My name is Suchit Anand and on behalf of the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Good and Capacity Development Working Group and to also to our webinar series. We are very pleased to have Dr. David Tarrant from the Open Data Institute with us today to present this Godan webinar on publishing open data from an organizational point of view. This is a very important topic uh, and we are, we are looking forward to hear from him. Godan, Godan supports the proactive sharing of open data to make information about agriculture and nutrition available, accessible and usable to deal with the urgent challenge of ensuring world food security. The objective of the Godan Working Group on uh, Capacity Development is to promote open data knowledge and increase awareness on ongoing open data initiatives, innovations and good practices. So I would like to also take this opportunity to welcome you all to the Godan's, uh, to the whole Godan movement and uh, specifically for this capacity development activities. So if you are not yet uh, join, please join this mailing list and contribute your ideas and we look forward to uh, get inputs from all of you on this. So I'm also very happy to uh, in, uh, introduce Dr. David Tarrant from the Open Data Institute. Dr. David Tarrant joined ODI from the University of Southampton where he was a lecturer in the Web and Internet Science Group. David has over 12 years experience with open agenda including a PhD on measuring the impact of open science. Before leaving the university, David created the first undergraduate course focusing on open data science. This highly acclaimed course encourages students to think critically about the opportunities to exploit open data. So this, uh, so, uh, I will now hand over to uh, David uh, for, for, for making his presentation. But I also want to inform everyone that uh, we will be recording this uh, session and all participants can, uh, if any queries or questions you have, please feel free to uh, ask the, uh, use the chat window for asking those questions. So I'm now going to hand over to David. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for the great introduction there. Just before we begin, I will say a little bit about the Open Data Institute, but just before that, uh, you'll just see on the slide in front of you, um, there's a little bit of interaction during this webinar, which is available to you at the link that is displayed there. This link is also uh, available to you via the chat, which is being posted by my colleague Pauline now into the chat window. Um, so if you can all open up that link, then you can also interact with some of the elements of this webinar. Okay, so while you're doing that, then I'll just say a little bit about what we're going to do today, a little bit about the Open Data Institute. So as I, as I was introduced there, yes, I joined the Open Data Institute almost four years ago now from the University of Southampton. Um, and the Open Data Institute was founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Sir Nigel Shadbolt to kind of catalyze the evolution and unlock the value of open data. That's what it, that's what it was founded upon. Um, now the Open Data Institute's main mission is to get data to those people who need it. And the data can really start to solve these challenges and that's why we, we see the GoDown project as such a, a crucial part of this in terms of getting the data out there that's needed to start solving these global problems around agriculture and nutrition. So that's what I'm going to be talking about a little bit from today which is uh, around the publishing open data from that organizational point of view. So we've got a few things that I want to cover in the agenda today. Uh, first one around, uh, and I'm going to look at this from an organizational point of view in terms of research because I noticed a lot of people are, who were signed up for this uh, particular webinar were from uh, research institutions. And so I thought I might focus on it a little bit from that. And as also was mentioned, I did a, a, my bit of my PhD was in and around research data. But then I'll talk a little bit about the benefits of research data. Um, and before looking at a little bit towards the end of the session on uh, why licenses are an important aspect of publishing open data and then how to start with the actual publication process. Now I hope in the 
in the email that was sent out about this webinar, uh, we also linked to a number of e-learning modules which the ODI has developed in conjunction with the European Data Portal. And so throughout this webinar, what I'm actually going to be doing is, is drawing on some of that content that is already out there for you to consume. And, and although you can't see my camera today, if you've looked at any of the videos in these modules, you will actually know what I look like, because uh, many of the, the videos we did as well as short introductions to these kind of areas in and around what open data is and what the value might be. So before we continue then, what I'm going to do, and hopefully if most of you have now got that link open that we sent around about the interaction, I thought we might give it a quick test to see if it works. And the way that we're going to do this, if you've got that window open, uh, is that a question should now appear in that window. Um, so the first thing to look at when we're talking at the impact of open data is just understanding critically what exactly it is that we're talking about uh, when we talk about open data. So if I give you a minute here just to answer this question, which you should have in the window in front of you that you can get out from the chat, if people can uh, have a go answering that question, and then we'll have a look at what, what the responses are that have been provided by. If I can give you a chance to do that now before I show the answer. Anyone? So as you can see from, from the answers that we're getting in so far, um, most people have gone for, and correctly gone for, the second aspect around open data being data that anyone can access, use, and share. Okay. Oh, we've got an answer there in, in terms of A, which is interesting. So we've now got most people going for B and an answer in terms of A. The reason that I, I would put this out is that uh, at the OB we have a, a definition of our own, um, open data being data that anyone can access, use, and share, which was answer B in that particular case. Um, and there are common myths that surround open data in terms of when you're thinking of it from an organizational point of view, often users start thinking about themselves and organizations start thinking about themselves as publishers. What open data actually is, um, is it's all about the user, not the publisher. So it's all about what the user is allowed to do with the data once they have it. So once they have it, are they allowed to use it? Are they permitted to use it? Are they permitted to share it freely with others? Which means that a couple of the myths that tend to be um, uh, believed is that you know open data has to be in a particular format or a machine readable format and if this is not true uh, of open data it, it does help in terms of uh, ensuring that people can reuse the data but it's not actually a condition of something being open and the second thing which I've highlighted here is that open data doesn't necessarily have to be free it has to be accessible by a lot of people it doesn't have to necessarily be free and this is something that comes from the open knowledge international uh, and their definition of open, where if you know if you think about things being free, suddenly we don't have any money to support those services. So what the Open Knowledge International say, and this is the definition we support here at the Open Data Institute, uh, is that the, the you can you can charge for the data, but you shouldn't make any profit from it, or it should come at minimal cost. So you can read more about this through the the, the first module that we link to. But that's a, just a good test of our questioning here and just a good basis to, from which I'm going to go forward in this uh, webinar today in terms of research data and how you might go about thinking about publishing that data and what the requirements are and how you go about starting the process. And so we're really going to be talking about what users are allowed to do and then how do you match that with your publication of that data. So now we've got question two. So when we're talking about research data and publishing research data, we also have to think about well, what's the primary reason or what's the primary driver for open uh, publication of research data. So have a look at the four options in the question. Tell me which one you think is the primary reason that open research data should be made available. Look at the second question. So as we can see here, most people have gone for option C, um, so, so that others can use your data. Now while this is actually a really important part of research data being available, and I know that it's an important part within GoDown. Actually, one of the primary um, reasons, and the, one of the primary drivers at the moment, which is why the question is so key, is actually option D there, which is the research being validated. This is the, same, the thing that actually journals and a lot of publishers and scientific publications around the world are pushing for, is that you should be able to allow others to validate your research. Right, to make sure that it is sound, uh, to make sure that it tells the truth. Okay, this is especially important if we think about the current uh, climate of, 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 of terms like fake news arriving, where people are making claims and thinking, well, how do we back these up? Where is the data for that? So there's a lot of drivers that have existed over the years and, and within funders within the European Commission to say that we need the data from these projects in order to validate the research. 
So that's the language that's being used as the primary driver. And so these other aspects, they're not wrong. They are benefits, but they're not necessarily the primary benefit, the primary driver for, for sharing of research data. And that actually has a big impact on how the research data uh, might be shared, uh, which is summed up here, which is that the, the publication of research data in order to validate research requires careful curation, much like a scientific publication. So if you think about when you're putting together a scientific output, if that's part of what your work is to do, or a report, you know, you're thinking very carefully about who the audience is, what the messaging is, and how the data within that is being represented to tell a clear and concise message. And so the same thing then applies to the data is that what is the requirement for the, for the research to be validated? Now that might not be the entire raw data set, it might be only a subset of the data that you are processing. Um, so that then can help guide that curation of that data before it's published. But that doesn't mean that there aren't the other benefits of research uh, data publication. Um, and so there are a number of others which I can briefly mention here. The first one, I've already mentioned this one quite a lot. Research can be validated. As I mentioned, this is being pushed by funders quite a lot. This is being pushed by uh, the journal publishers who, you know, this is one of the primary things that's been pushing institutions and organizations to make sure their data is available is that it's being mandated as part of funding arrangements. But their primary driver has been about the research being validated. Um, Another aspect uh, that's really key here, um, another ben big benefit, is actually the, the, the benefit that comes from increased citation. And there's been a series of research on this uh, that says that an open way of working, so allowing open access to your publication, rather than it being behind an expensive paid journal, but having an open version, uh, having open source code, you're using open source tools, um, and then making your research openly available, or using open data that's already available, can lead uh, to increased citation, which of course is a benefit for those publishing that data or publishing that paper. So this is showing the benefit of open overall, and the research data is a part of that. And that really goes hand in hand with the next aspect, which is in and around institutional reputation. Um, and there was a quote this year from John Wood, who's the co-chair of the Research Data Alliance, who said that uh, the initial investment that, that institutions go for is scientific, but the ultimate return to them is the impact, the economic and the social impact. And this really helps build the institutional reputation. Which is really about, you know, what is the benefit for the institutions um, and kind of is one of the arguments that are critical to use in order to combat the fear of what comes with point four, which is also a benefit but comes with a lot of fear, is that others can use our data. So if we were to publish all of our data openly, all of the raw data, um, then might others come to the conclusion and get the publication first? Uh, and there's these kind of uh, arguments around that, but it, you know, the, the benefits in terms of building a reputation and the impact that it can have comes with the expertise that an institution or an organization have. And that's really about what you do with the data. And so allowing others to use it can open up that innovation opportunity quicker. And as I say, generate that citation quicker because people can still uh, thank you for the data. Uh, and so uh, there's been a lot of um, work in the area of data citation over the past few years, as well as publication citation. So these kind of things can help uh, build this impact and show the benefit of publishing data so that others can use it in a much rawer form. So that's kind of covered the first two points, and I wanted to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions. Um, so if anybody at this point had any particular questions on that first aspect, then please feel free to share them now. Uh, I'll give you a, a minute or so while I just set up the next point and get the next questions ready. So just moving on to the second bit then, we can see that there is a, a series of benefits to be had, but those necess don't necessarily tie in exactly to the way that data can be published due to the fact that people might have different goals for around the data being published, which is, you know, we saw in that last question about the difference between reuse and the funder's mandate, which, which is about um, research data being, research being able to be validated. So in this next part, I want to talk about the two key aspects of if you are going to be publishing data for any of those purposes, you know, how do you start and go about doing that? So this links to the other two modules that we had within the uh, pre-reading or the, the bits within the emails. The first one around why do we need to license, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I want to touch on how useful is my data, which looks at a few of the publication guidelines that help 
make the data reusable by others. And I want to look at a standard that's now 16 years old uh, that still gets talked about quite a lot just to introduce some of its core concepts. So let's move on. I've got another question for you. So back to the poll again. It should be displayed on your screens now. So this is about data. You know, if you find data, it's available on the web. You found it. It's on the web somewhere. That means that anyone can access and use it, right? Think true or false? Yeah, I think that's most people responded. This is an interesting uh, reply. Let me have a look. Display that one on the screen. There we go. Um, so as you can see, majority of people saying false. Yeah, about a quarter of, of people saying true. Well, those people who've responded false are indeed correct. Okay, it's available on the web. But, uh, the keyword here that means that anyone can access, who can access it, can use it. False. Um, this is not true. This is due to copyright. So anything that is created or has an intellectual effort in its creation, automatically assumes copyright or rights reserved. And you don't have to put a C on it. You don't have to put the year on it. And it doesn't matter if you find it on the web or in a shop or on a piece of paper somewhere. All of these things have copyright. Unless that is that you have been given a license to use something, then it's copyright or right to reserve. As I say, you don't have to actually write this on the thing. Um, and so services like Facebook and Twitter, and etc., you know, they, they have very clear statements that say who owns the data, who owns the content, and you're not permitted to, to use it unless you get explicit permission to use it. So just because it's on the web doesn't necessarily mean you can use it. There are a few exceptions in copyright for fair use, reporting, um, there's also exceptions for research uh, and educational use, but you'll notice in the question, if it's still on your screen, I did put the word anyone. So we're talking about anybody, not just those people in research or in particular types of organizations. So that means in order for something to be truly open, then we have to license it. And there is a license set uh, that is available that some of you may have seen before, some of you may have used before, called the Creative Commons uh, set of licenses. Uh, and they allow you to specify uh, a license on your data that says what people can do with it and what people must do um, as a result of using it. So generally, the Creative Commons licenses say you can use or reuse or share uh, this piece of content. Um, but with the following restrictions, and these are the common four restrictions that you will see on a Creative Commons license. So just to go through these briefly uh, and how they might benefit the publication of data. Um, the first one, um, attribution, there you can see. So if you put this restriction uh, on, on, your, on your license, then people must credit you as the source or you as the creator, the owner of the data, the copyright holder of the data must be credited when the data is used. So think of this as a citation, you know, back to the owner um, or a thank you back to the owner. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way of saying, you know, who's been using my data and finding that out by, by following those credits. The second uh, restriction that you can see there is an, uh, a non-commercial restriction where you can say you can use my data, but you can't make money from it. So this you know, applies quite um, to some data where people want to, to share it but not allow commercial exploitation of that data. The third one you can see there is the no derivatives clause. And this says, as, it, as you can see underneath, your version must equal mine. You can't change it in any way. So you know, if it's a piece of data, you can't change any of the values. Or it might be a picture where you can't crop it or do anything with it like that. And finally, the fourth aspect there, share alike. So this says that uh, if you change it or if you use it, um, then you must share your changes under an equivalent license. Okay, So repeat the same license or an equivalent license that allows others to use it. So this is also often known as the viral license. So if people use your content, then they have to share it alike to, so that other people can use it. So before we move forward then, I shall activate the next question in our poll. And our next question would be, so what, which of these four, and you can select multiple options here, are, are allowed in an open license? So which of these restrictions can you choose and the content still remains open? And you can pick more than one. Let me just get the results up to question number four. There we go. So a majority of people going for A and B, which are indeed the correct uh, answers to this question. So anyone... In the, in the definition of open that we brought up at the beginning, data that anyone can access, use, and share, that does include making commercial gain from the data. 
so using it in a commercial product or a commercial setting so if you think about this within agriculture it might be that you're developing services that you sell on to farmers um, which use openly available weather data right now that might be absolutely critical for the service it might be a commercial service that's selling insurance and this is something that the climate corporation we're doing um, over in the US is using open weather data in order to inform their products that they were selling around insurance but also provide um, tactical uh, data for farmers to use when they were in their fields. Um, so this was a company that used entirely open data in order to provide better services and be more competitive in the market in order to drive down prices of competitors and to show that you don't need to have expensive commercially sourced data in order to build such services. So while they, you know, they were selling those services, they were making commercial profit from them, um, we can see the benefit from having companies be allowed to build competitive uh, solutions into the market. So this is something that's very key within open data is the aspect of being able to allow people to make money from it, to be able to get employment from it because you know, economic growth is also related to social growth and environmental growth. So the, all of them go hand in hand so you have to allow that to happen. Although there is quite some contention in some places around you know we want to be able to use that. Um, D, no derivatives um, is a really interesting one. Um, and it's only 6% of the responses were in this area. Um, so no, no derivatives, the key there is if you, a lot, there's no such thing as clean, perfect data. We have an expression at the ODI, which is that, uh, sorry, I have a challenge at the ODI, which is if anyone ever c t comes to our office with a perfectly clean data set, um, we present them with a pink unicorn. Uh, we refer to it as the unicorn data set. So there's no such thing as perfectly clean data, so all of it you're going to have to change just to be able to actually make an accurate representation of the, of the data that you received. Um, otherwise you might actually mislead um, you by using the data if you don't change it. So you know, being able to clean and analyze the data is a key part of the process. So no derivatives has to be allowed as in you have to allow people to change and modify the data in order to fix problems. Um, there is, there are aspects of round licenses that you can put in that say that people cannot pretend to be your organization. Um, so this is the non-endorsement clause, which I haven't brought in here, um, which is often the worry about when pe people change the data to try and misrepresent the truth. Um, then actually it's about saying that it's their responsibility if they've changed the data, it's, it's them, if, you know, if the data is then published and they've republished it or the original source data is published, then going back to the point of publishing research data, you can verify the research that's been published by going back to the source data and redoing the same experiment again. But A and B are absolutely allowed in, in the world of open data. Saying thank you, attributing is, is brilliant, um, and sharing alike it enforces that other people join that open community. They share what they do um, alike with others. So those are key points about licensing the data so others can use it, but don't put restrictions on it, which means it's no longer open. So just a couple of aspects on that then. Um, this grid here that I'm showing um, just shows the importance of licensing the data properly. You can see the blue corner up in the top left um, shows all of the Creative Commons licenses, I haven't had time to go through them all today, which are open licenses and the matrix shows that you can take any data or content that's available under those licenses and combine it with any other content that is available under those licenses. So you can see the, the green ticks across everything, so this is a fully open block, you can combine and and merge with all data and content that's available under these licenses. As soon as you get into the non-commercial and the no derivatives um, uh, clauses, then you can see there are certain aspects where share alike is not compatible with non-commercial, for example. So you can't combine those two data sets together in order to find some new insight. It's not actually allowed under the license terms. So you do have to be careful when using data that the licenses are compatible if you've got two different data sources. So that when you combine them, you can still um, fulfill the requirements of those licenses. So an open license, everything, um, they're all compatible with each other, the top four by four grid. But as soon as you get outside that, it's a bit difficult to combine and, and derive insight from the data. The importance of licensing is exactly this. Your data can be the best machine readable data ever, but without the right license, no one else can use it. Um, and this is, this is a shame because we've seen a lot over the years of people heading towards technically brilliant data but they're not actually licensing it properly so that others can build upon it and actually 
develop and do research or uh, develop products upon it, and, and, and that's been a big problem. And the interesting thing within the open data world, there was a study done in 2013 of websites that claim to be open data portals or open data websites. They use the words open data across them extensively when talking about their data, but 75% of the data that claimed to be open wasn't due to incorrect or a missing license. Uh, this research was done in 2013 by Thomas Levine, and the link is there if you want to look more into the type of data available and the data sources. Um, but it's quite a shocking statistic that you know 75% of it that claimed to be open data actually wasn't due to the fact that it wasn't licensed so that anyone could access, use, and share it. So that means that you can accurately measure what open data is. You can you can look at something and go, because of this licensing restriction, you can say that is open data or not by simply looking at the license. It's not a fuzzy term, it's a well-defined term um, which you can use uh, in order to measure how countries, governments, and initiatives are doing with publishing open data because you can simply count the number of data sets that are or not by their license. So that's covered a little bit about why licenses are important. And now I just want to get on to the final part of the session, and then we've got time for questions on how to start with publishing of data. And I said that I wanted to reference um, a, 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 a best practice guideline that's now a number of years old. Um, and this comes from the five stars of uh, the linked open data. Um, this came on the back of, of Tim Berners. So Tim Berners-Lee published a paper in the Scientific American in 2001 on the future of the web. And interestingly, if we go back to the beginnings of the web, when Tim Berners-Lee published his original paper while he was a researcher at CERN, interestingly, um, the comment that his supervisor wrote on the top of this paper, which was the origins of the web, and if you're thinking about the web today, it's, you know, it's perhaps one of the biggest, one of the single things that's changed society as a whole throughout the whole world over the, this generation is the web. It's had such a profound impact. But when Tim Berners-Lee originally put the idea forward in his first publication, the comment his supervisor wrote back on the top of that publication, on the top of that paper that he was going to try and publish, was vague but interesting. Vague but interesting. So it didn't really see much in it. But of course it went on to be, you know, this is one of the single biggest things that changed society. And so when Tim Berners-Lee published this, other, this, this kind of follow-up paper, The Future of the Web in the Scientific American in 2001, People didn't think, you know, didn't want to think vague but interesting, um, and so they took it kind of more seriously. Um, and so it set in place this vision for the future of the web and how data is going to become a key part of the resources that we can autonomously use and machines and artificial intelligence can use in order to make decisions uh, for us. And everyone thought this was an amazing vision that Tim had for the web, and obviously the first iteration pretty much came true, so we won't ignore this, this vision, uh, and asked him, well, how do we get there? How do we get from where we are today to there? And what he came up with uh, was this, this simple five-star schema um, to try and help people understand the kind of the, the progress of how to get from one thing to the other. And this five-star scheme is available on fivestardata.info, but I would, I would, I would, this would come with a pinch of salt from me. I would come with a warning that the five-star schema now is 16 years old, 2001. So if you think about the kind of the phones and the technology that we're using in 2001, things have moved forward quite a lot. So, but this standard is still, um, this guideline is still referenced quite a lot when it comes to doing things in the future of the web and the web of data. So what I wanted to do is just kind of cover the first three stars of this standard. The first star here, OL, um, actually stands for open license. Now it has a picture of a PDF, and here's my slight warning. The pictures you might want to ignore. Okay, But the first star, just written underneath it in the text there, I've just uh, uh, highlighted that above, OL stands for open license. So even back in 2001, Tim knew that in order for computers to be able to use the data that's out there, in order to make decisions, in order for machines to interact with the data, they would have to do it ethically within the legal frameworks. And the only way that we can do that properly is to have open licensed, licensed data. Knowing that they can use it, combine it with other data, that's why the grid is so um, key on the previous slide. 
knowing that machine can take one piece of data from one location and take one piece of data from another location, combine them, make a decision upon them, and not be breaking any particular licensing restriction in the law because of the fact that that data is openly licensed. So even back in 2001, Tim knew that the license is the most important thing. It's the first thing you have to do on this journey. It's going upstairs. You can't really skip over them. You shouldn't skip over them. So the first thing you do, put your data or content out there under an open license. The other two I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, the second one begins with the, the letters RE, and the third one begins with the letters OF. So if you look at the diagram for a second, and then I'm going to um, activate the next question that I'm going to ask you, just to see what you think the second star means. So that one should be active now. Have a look at this chart, uh, this diagram, and then see what you think the answer to the second question is. What does the second star, do you think, mean? RE. Okay, let's have a look at the answers to this one then. There we go. There we go. Thank you all. Um, so as you say, it uh, remained a two-thirds, one-third split. Between me saying that and actually coming back, it did go to 50-50 between these two answers, um, and then went back to a two-third, one-third split. Um, so as I said regarding this slide, um, the, the diagrams and the, the, the uh, underneath, the format diagrams, are misleading. Um, and so a lot of people think, you know, publish it in this proprietary format, and if you've seen the third star, the third star says OF, which is an open format which often means that, okay, what's the stage before an open format? Well, maybe it's a proprietary format. Um, and that's actually uh, untrue. The second star is publish it in its most reusable format. So, again, going back to the very beginning of what I was talking about in this webinar, you've got the whole objective of, of reuse, people being able to use the data, what, pro, what uh, data formats are they familiar with. And Excel might be one of those formats, but equally they might be familiar with other formats. And the data itself might be in a CAD format, or it might even be in an open format already, and that might be the most reusable format. And the second thing, of course, the most reusable format might be the one that suits the research purpose, the one that suits the, the goal of validating that research. And that might be a binary file, or it might be a, a database dump of some sort. But the, the whole idea of the second star is to say, well, in order for the data to be usable, we first need it in open license, which is the first star. And then let's give it to people in a format that they can read, a human readable, a human usable, maximum reuse format. So what is the format that encourages maximum reuse of the data? regardless of whether that's open or proprietary, regardless of who develops that format, regardless of its structure or type. And so that's really what the second star is trying to emphasize, is the reusability aspect. Uh, but quite a lot of the time it gets referred to as, as kind of the Excel, the bit that where the data is collected for a lot of people might be in a spreadsheet in Excel. But that's an example of a reusable format that comes with graphs and charts and formatting. Um, and multiple sheets and other things that you don't get when you come to a, the third star, which stands for open format, <clears throat> which is where if you save that an Excel spreadsheet into a CSV, comma separated values, then you actually lose quite a lot of the formatting. So you actually lose quite a lot of the reusability and contextual understanding, human readability of that format. So be careful when you're thinking about the publishing of your data because putting it in the under an open license is the first thing. Then think about what's the most reusable format for our users, regardless of what type of format it is, regardless of the standard. And then think about, well, is there an open format that ensures things like longevity, that ensures things like that format can be preserved and opened in years to come if, for example, the company was to take that proprietary format, if it was proprietary at the second star, um, to the grave if that company was to go away. And so that's really the key of the first three stars, is that you might actually fulfill the first three with putting an open license on, and the next two with one file. That might be one data format. But it, the second one doesn't mention it's not about proprietary. Um, it's about it being its most reusable form, so whatever that is that people can instantly get involved with and get using. So we've done the question five. I've mentioned a little bit about this. It's also covered in, in the module in the European Data Portal. Um, most reusable format doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in a certain structure. And, and we hear a lot of talked about you know, which format data should be in. And lots of people campaign for different sorts of formats. Um, but there is no one, co one correct format or structure for all data. A lot of data might be tabular, like your Excel spreadsheets. 
a lot of data might be hierarchical, like an, uh, um, an organization hierarchical chart or um, uh, a um, family tree. That's the word I was looking for. Um, this is hierarchical data. I've seen lots of people try and represent a family tree in an organizational chart in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I, this could be an interesting challenge. I haven't seen anyone do it successfully because the data structure of a tabular data set does not suit a hierarchical structure. Um, and then there's the last kind of structure there that you can see represented by the picture on the far right, which is a network structure where everything can be interconnected to other things in any direction, forwards or backwards, unlike in a hierarchy where it's in one direction only. Um, people can, so this is like a friendship network on Facebook. I can be friends with Pauline on Facebook and Pauline can be friends with me on Facebook. So it goes round in circles. Um, so this is where you get a network structure in data. And as you can see, again, those are not very easy to represent in a tabular structure, but equally tabular data is not very easy to represent in network structure. So when it comes to thinking about when you're publishing your data, you think both about who the users are, what's going to be the most reusable format, and then what structure the data is in. You may have to publish data in lots of different structures, potentially in lots of different formats, in order to maximize the reusability and maximize the potential for the research to be validated, and thus maximizing the impact um, that it might have. And that brings me to the final part. Um, in this webinar, which is just this slide. So thinking about the different agendas means that you might have different priorities. So thinking about the, if, you, if you're on a reuse agenda, so you're trying to open up the research data as we saw from uh, a number of people in this webinar, if you're trying to open up the uh, the data so that uh, other people can use it. 75% of people on that question said that it's about reuse for them. So if that's your agenda, Right, then the priority might be, well, what formats and structures and licenses do I need to apply to maximize that? So obviously an open license maximizes your potential audience. What formats and structures the data might be in, well, what, or what's your, who is your audience and what common formats and structures are already out there that the data is used to put in? Not necessarily to create your own, but to go and have a look at what the community is using, because that will maximize your potential reuse. Research validation, 25% of people went for that on my first question, and that's going to be much more about creating the data set in a particular way that suits the rest of the research, the research methods uh, and the formula outlined in the paper or the research outlined in the publication. The data should really match that so that people can instantly go from one to the other without having to skip through lots of hoops and run lots of different algorithms that aren't outlined in the publication. You might also have an agenda of preservation taking data and making sure it's available in 25 years if you've got a preservation strategy that looks that far. And there it might be about having uh, open formats, uh, very particular formats that, that have this kind of long-term support and understanding within your institution or institutional setting. And then there's the other agenda about in, you know, internal data management might require particular use of data in different structures and formats. So that can have a different agenda which sets different priorities on how that data is then taken from the internal systems and then published. So you've got to really match up all of these things in order to, to look at well, what's the agenda that we're setting here, what's our primary goal, and what are going to be the choices and the communities that we're going to have to build in order to succeed in that area. So I'd like to end that there. Obviously, um, I put together the links, uh, which we can send around again to the, uh, the modules, the e-learning that's been made available that goes through a lot of this. What I've tried to do in this webinar is trying to bring it within the context of, of an organization who might be doing research or publishing data in the area of agriculture to try and think about the different agendas that you might have already within your institution and how you might match up to those to you know, fulfill that aim of actually helping out with the global agriculture and nutrition problems that exist. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to put them in the channel. Other than that, I'll say thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Uh, that's a very informative presentation, and I think uh, it, it really uh, was a very important webinar for our capacity building uh, group as well, because again, you know, publishing open data from different views and you know, from an organizational point of view, you know, from the things you told, will uh, help all of us to think more ideas. David, I have one question. Uh, basically, trying to understand. You know, for example, when I look at uh, look at the last ten years, you know, the uh, for example, research funders more and more trying to mandate the 
open data publishing you know what how do you see this will have an accelerating uh, kind of effects for the future or what what is your kind of thinking on that i mean i think it will have an it will have an effect as the the effect as more and more people put in place systems that are able to uh, and institutional processes that support the publication and sharing of the data and and people are already doing it to see the other impacts and i know that NASA being on a particular organization, I don't know if there's anyone on the call from NASA, but I saw that there were a few registered, you know, in terms of putting their open data online to allow others to do, you know, deep, deep space exploration and, and analysis of the vast quantities of data that they've been collecting. You know, we don't have enough people in the world to possibly analyze all of that data within NASA. So, you know, opening it up to more potential uh, people, you know, brings that benefit of others being able to, to use that data in order to, you know, make maybe SpaceX and using it and other programs and it kind of open up the, not just opens up the sky, opens up space, you know, opens mm -hmm. us up to new um, technologies, opens us up to new, you know, the reusable rocket is amazing, you know, but, you know, it's possible with commercial and public kind of collaboration in terms of that. So these kind of things are, are these are amazing bits of progress that we're seeing and I see that more of them will come as more people start releasing that data for others to use. And more of these collaborations can be formed in order to push the innovation forward quicker so that others can use the data. At the moment, I see a lot of push around this validation of the mm -hmm. research, making sure that things are true, making sure that the research is is is, is valid and, and decent and people are making it up or you know whatever. So it, to be able to see that is, is key because often you know there's a confusion at the moment and I think there's a lot of research going on around what are the boundaries of the data publication, how much do I need to publish because a lot of institutions collect petabytes of data. Mm. And most of it is either not understandable by anybody apart from maybe the person who collected it, but that's often questionable. Um, but, you know, going into what's the stuff that we should be publishing that's, that is valuable for others to be using. But we may not know what that value is yourself because what's valuable to you might not be of any value to someone else and what's not valuable to you might be of value to someone else. So this is where challenges and overlap come with big data in terms of this research and what we might be seeing being made available. But so limiting it down to a validation kind of approach helps kind of limit down the amount of data that gets published to be usable and, uh, and understandable by others. But I, I, it will progress in this area, lots of research going on. Yep. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and there is a lot of, uh, for those of you who have seen the materials that was sent along with the, uh, with the webinar announcement, you know, for, please feel free to look at those amazing uh, resources uh, to learn uh, if you are new to this uh, open data aspects as well. So it's a really amazing uh, resources. And one more thing, David, if, I, if you can give some background on that, uh, the materials you uh, developed for the European data, data project, it might also be useful for the audience. Yes, so we were approached um, as part of the European Data Portal project to produce a training library of resources that uh, everyone could engage with to learn more about open data uh, and its impact within Europe um, mm -hmm. and how people can go about engaging and publishing data. Um, and so we produced those, there's 13 modules in total uh, mm -hmm. that cover everything from the basics of what open data is. Um, all the way through to some of the, the aspects I've mentioned on linking up the web of data, but also how you measure success in your initiatives, which is another key thing so you can do your own benchmarking and analysis in initiatives. You can find out more about the formats um, of data from the, the European data portal. Um, we've also published, there are, there are areas of other e-learning that we have, we have published and worked upon in other areas, but this is a, and we will be adding a few more modules to the European data portal in the coming months. Um, that will cover other aspects as well. So it's worth keeping an eye on those. And uh, if you if you want to take them offline, so you don't be, don't need to be in front of your computer, you can search the app stores on Google and um, Apple. If you search the app for ODI Learning, you'll find the 13 modules available to you to download onto your phone. Mm. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think uh, you know we will conclude now because of the timing time. But I want to again thank again David uh, and uh, also uh, Pauline from the Open Data Institute, as well as all of our colleagues at the CTA, Silvana, Suma, and Chris Addison, who had worked 
to help to make this webinar possible. So I would like to also uh, welcome you all to join the Godan uh, Capacity Development Working Group. Uh, I have put the uh, link of the our mailing list. So you know, just put your details and join the mailing list because it's very important to uh, you know have ongoing discussions. So please feel free to discuss uh, you know uh, that uh, ideas that David's uh, presented today in the mailing list. And if you have any questions or if you think you know if you're an organization and if you had faced some challenges publishing your data, please feel free to share those in the mailing list so that we can you know, uh, collectively harness the wisdom of the uh, people who are in our community and get more ideas. So please join in the mailing list. Uh, the uh, webinars are one of our key tools for the capacity development activities to uh, broaden outreach for open data. So we really hope to build upon these kind of excellent webinars uh, for, for the future. All this will be recorded and for those who, who, are, who are not able to attend this webinar today, they, we will make sure the recordings are made available in YouTube and other uh, ch channels for, for, uh, for, for the others as well. So we will have a next webinar on May 16th. We will send uh, details of the, of the webinar, uh, the presentation, the presenter and, uh, and other details to all of you in due course. But I would like to thank everyone who joined today's webinar for, for your time and being part of the Godan initiative. And looking forward to see you all uh, soon. Thank you very much.